was there any points where you felt like I'm not ready for this? Holy shit. Like every job. Every job. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Can I get an introduction from you? So your name and, and sure. what it is that you do. Hi, I'm Matt Webb. I'm an assistant director and producer from Sydney, Australia, now living in New York. I'm going to pull up uh, I'm going to pull up your IMDb because you've worked on some pretty damn awesome projects. Um Hacksaw Ridge was that was pretty recent, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was we shot that in the last half of 2015. No shit. And then released last year. Dude, I um, Natalie and I were in Melbourne actually, and we were staying at this like it was like a bougie tent hotel on top of a roof at some ho- hotel, uh, and then she wanted to go to a museum. I'm not, I don't really like museums like they're cool, but I'm not really that big into them. And then. Uh, I saw Hacksaw Ridge was playing, so I, I went to Hacksaw Ridge. On your own? <laughs> yeah, on my own, by myself. <laughs> and it was me and like a bunch of 40 to 50 year olds. <laughs> yeah. And then Natalie went to, uh, the, she went to the art gallery by herself. Well, so it's an interesting film it. because everybody thinks it's a war film and it's going to be killing and war the whole entire time. But it starts off as a love story, really. It mm-hmm. starts off as a drama for probably two thirds and then they eventually end up in Japan in the war. And that's when it really goes mental. Yeah, there is like really a slow build up yeah. to the war, which yeah. is like, yeah, going into it, you don't expect it. Um, real quick, so Great Gatsby, uh, Mad Max, like a lot of these, this is, these were all filmed in Australia. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's dope. And I want to, well, we can talk about the, these films and some of these projects and, and what you've done along the way. Also a book, Set Life. This is great. This feels like a um, <laughs> like a show, like a yeah. like an actual show. Look at this. We've got props. This is great. We've got everything. This is great, man. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to check this out yet, but I really want to read it. Um, so this is about your your story. Kind of advice for this is kind of what the podcast is about. It's advice for people who are just getting started out, who are trying to make their own way. In yeah, exactly. Time. It's not like a memoir or anything like that. It's just tips and advice for people starting out in the film industry, based on my experiences and and other people. There's about ten interviews in there as well with people at the top of their game a couple of them have won oscars uh production designers first ad's producers everybody so it shows a great scope of people and what they do dude this is fantastic this yeah. is like really well put together like even like this is professional because i know you know sometimes you can you didn't make this through like the amazon there's like an amazon thing where you can kind of print books um and you sell uh, it per no that one that one was printed in australia so that's for through, like, through the distribution in australia uh but you can buy it on amazon print yeah, on demand yeah, as this, well yeah this is beautiful i get when did you know that you wanted to get into to film uh as a teenager i started getting into it and it came out of just buying a video camera and filming friends doing dumb stuff uh so whether it be yeah. surfing or hanging out or riding motorbikes or going uh snowboarding all that kind of stuff. I just would take my camera and start filming things and then putting it together on my laptop and there would be terrible edits, but my mom would say it was great and (laughs) friends would watch it and that kind of stuff. And it it slowly evolved and grew and then eventually started buying better equipment and not that that made any difference. It was still (laughs) about what I was shooting, which was always just dumb pranks and and guys being guys as late teenagers. Dude, I actually did the same thing. That's so funny. <laughs> I, I forgot about it and I've never talked about it on the podcast, but, um, oh man, I forget what the name of it, but we would go out and like the pranks were, they were like mean. It's like, you know how now it's like cool prank, but you just like ruin that person's life. Like I remember we wrapped my one, we at like 4am, we wrapped my one friend's Jeep in saran wrap the entire thing and we filmed it. And then cause he had to go to work the next morning at like 6am or so. And we kept calling him trying to get him to come out, but he wouldn't pick up. Yeah. And then uh, like we heard, cause we didn't wait around for it. And then uh, he was so pissed off. <laughs> like he was late to work that day, had to unwrap it, but it was a... Uh, that's how I got started out too. It was just like, was this like the jackass days? Is that, did that yeah, inspire you? Yeah, I think you? that inspired it, but it was a little bit different. We were just more looking for the adventure rather than being cruel to people or really inflicting pain. We weren't about that, but yeah. we do dumb things. Like I remember we set a couple of guys on fire because we could, <laughs> we'd seen it being done before. So you just wrap them in heaps of layers of clothing and then yeah. put some kerosene on them and and lit them on fire. And they were doing this for a while and then jumped off a bridge into the water. Holy shit. Do you still have this footage? <laughs> Yeah, it's on YouTube, I think. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, you you said, we, we weren't trying to hurt anybody, but we just lit some people on fire. Well, they were, they were volunteers. I sure. mean, 
They were part of the group. They, were, they, they chose difference. to do it. Yeah, yeah the difference we, between running up to somebody and letting them on yeah, fire. Yeah, we weren't just scaring people in public <laughs> or anything like that. Another little episode we did was called Pimp My Paddock Basher. Which is I like, have no idea. I don't know if that's an Australian yeah, thing. My yeah, Paddock Dasher? Pa- basher. Paddock oh, Basher. Paddock so it's like an old car that you just trash in a paddock. Yeah. Uh, like, like a rally car. Right. Um, so we got an old car and spray painted it and put like a uh, cardboard body kit on it and then had a race around a track in a friend's backyard. That's amazing. So, <laughs> that was all based on the Pimp My Rides. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We just yeah. did dumb of, things like that. see a lot of the influences yeah. based upon yeah. that. Just watch and, MTV and then go out and film your own stuff. Yeah, and then the more they put those disclaimers, do not try this at home, the more people <laughs> feel inspired to yeah, actually do it. Is that a challenge? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, totally did the same thing. And then, so you, you kind of, it sounds like you started in a very similar way to me and then you kept buying new gear this was before college this was high school days yeah so yeah, yeah. end of high school mm-hmm. uh 17 18 and then how did that progress and then you you decide all right like this uh, is cool i want to try to actually did you feel like you could do this for a living did that feel yeah attainable? i think i was always interested in doing it uh i wasn't sure exactly what i wasn't sure if i wanted to be a director or in post-production or producing or i knew i didn't want to be an actor i never wanted to be on the camera um But uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. I took a year off straight after school and uh, came and lived in Colorado for six months, did a ski season, uh, and then worked and went to college. And that's when I was studying filmmaking. And even at the end of my degree, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Like after studying, people were like, I'm a DP now. It's like, no, you're not. (laughs) You've (laughs) just got a college degree. Yeah. Uh, You can't just give yourself any title. Yeah. Or some people knew they wanted to be writers or directors. Uh, I still wasn't sure. I I knew what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be an editor because I just hate sitting there and editing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I knew I wanted to be involved in big projects. The big films always interested me. So You didn't want to do like the, the smaller projects you wanted to... And that seems to be like more difficult it's like how do you jump right into doing yeah look i was happy to do the small projects i i just found it interesting that people would come out and claim that they were some amazing director or writer or Mm -hmm. because i just knew it wasn't true yeah so i was happy to start right at the bottom and i didn't know where that would be um but i knew i wanted to work with people that were actually working in the industry at the top of their game rather rather than saying Claiming I'm a director and, and working on short films for the next five years. You went to school in Australia. Yeah. Sydney? In Sydney. Sydney. Yeah. Education system and, and college is a little bit different in Australia than, than America. Yeah, I think so. So I lived, I still lived at home when I went to college or mm-hmm. university is what we call it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the experience is quite different. My course was very easy. I was only there three days a week. Oh, no shit. Um, and yeah, it was simple. Worked the rest of the time and... And it was film. It was film. Yeah. So yeah. I was a Bachelor of Communications and majored in film. So we had a lot of boring subjects about learning the history of, not film, but uh, all, I don't know, random boring stuff. Did you do like, the- <laughs> like film theory? And yeah, like, we did all that. What does the color red mean? Yeah. And watched random films. You're like, what was the point of that? You just wasted two hours of my life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm pretty sure this is never going to come up on set. Yeah. But yeah. And I could do that for- at home if I wanted to. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, why are we watching movies in yeah. class? When do we just get to make the films? Like, yeah. That's all we wanted to do. Did you but- do any of that? Like that yeah, hand, yeah. practical stuff? Yeah. It was really cool. We did one subject. We were actually the last year that did it. Uh, we worked with 16 mil film. So that was really cool oh, shooting great. it and then having to wait uh, until the following week to get our results back from what we actually shot and being like, oh, we made some mistakes oh, there. Wow. Yeah. Some films were completely just washed out or had big grain marks through them. And so that good was to, cool. Good to learn from that. To, yeah, to exactly. See. Yeah. yeah. That's what I found. Actually, uh, you know, while editing, I, I do enjoy editing. I think there, there's kind of a... And there, I like the balance of both. If I was just a full-time editor like you, I would, I, like, <laughs> I would just kill myself. I'm like, I can't just sit in a dark room all day yeah. for eight to 10 hours a day having no contact with other people. And some people love it. Some people Good love on it. Them, like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like if that's what you love, go for it. Um, I do like the balance, but uh, doing the editing, uh, similar to that, it, it kind of helps you to understand what you actually need when you're shooting. So like if I'm yeah. doing some corporate stuff or shooting an event or even shooting a documentary and like they're say I'm editing somebody else's footage or I'm editing my own footage, I'm like, why didn't I hold that shot for like an extra five seconds or an yeah. extra 10 seconds? And then by being having your foot in a little bit of everything, you kind of appreciate and understand what the other person should be actually going yeah. for. I actually talk about that in the book. 
uh, if people are saying they want to become a director, having a good understanding of editing and even spending some time as a junior editor or however they can mm-hmm. to, to learn what coverage you need and what coverage you don't. Yeah. Because when you're under pressure on set and everybody's looking to you, do you want that shot or not? You're going to need to know whether it's going to hit the cutting room floor or, or oh. whether it's going to make make the scene. Yeah. So. I love this. Like, I was just talking to my buddy yesterday who, who shot his first uh, Comedy Central pilot and like it's funny because the the stakes are so high it's it's easier when it's a small crew when you're just doing it by yourself and you just got a couple friends that are out there shooting yeah. it like you can shoot all day you can shoot 14 hours 16 <laughs> hours doesn't matter oh we'll yeah. just we'll we'll get the shot tomorrow yeah you cannot do that on a big budget set where yeah. overtime what is like one hour of overtime cost <laughs> yeah. It's like, and it's massive, right? Yeah. So the stakes are really high. And I think that in, in a way it's exciting at the same time stressful. And I imagine the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. Yeah, exactly. Practice makes perfect and you get confident in your decisions. And at the end of the day, the director and the producer are leading a company of 500 people sometimes on mm-hmm. set, plus your actors and your extras. So it's a huge group of people that you're in charge of and, and everybody's looking at you for direction. So you've got to be confident in that role. Sure. You go through college. Did you get any jobs then? Was there anything? Uh, that... No, I was just working. I was working at a surf shop, selling clothes ah, to, to nice. make ends meet. You uh, surf in your spare time too? Yeah, yeah. That's great. So, I want to learn how to surf. That's uh, moving to LA in, in a uh, couple yeah, months. Yeah. Like that's my one thing I want to try to... Do you have any tips for beginner surfers like what just keep doing it just keep doing yeah. it. yeah and you're a fit guy so that's good you've got some upper body strength so yeah that, that's half the struggle is just, just getting paddling. up You'd paddling be surprised how much paddling you do i think it's probably pretty endurance based right uh yeah once yeah to to depends how big the surf is if it's small it's okay but if it's bigger than you expect just paddling out and getting out the back where you can just sit and, and chill for a little while do i need a full body suit one of those wetsuits is that a th- uh not if no we're coming into summer you should be fine okay is that that's just for the cold so you don't yeah. get like hypothermia yeah. yeah all right cool i'm trying to get a tan i'm, I'm in la you know yeah exactly no you'll be um, bored shots. all right so you were working at the shop and then you, you once yeah you graduate, so i wasn't working in film at all yeah uh the very last subject i did was work experience i think american colleges do it a lot better i see that you have a lot of internships and people will do two months or six months at a time at these various production houses and stuff throughout their their degree which is fantastic because that's how they get first-hand experience Mm -hmm. we didn't have that so much we just made short films and practice techniques and that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. um so my last subject i did some work experience on a channel nine drama which is like a just a tv station Mm -hmm. um it was called rescue special ops um, nice. which was really fun because it was about a team of rescue guys that went to car crashes and cut people out or uh, abseiled down cliffs to rescue some it's like real stuff like no real... no no oh, it was all re- drama oh. it was all scripted yeah, oh, okay. so it was all about the love stories and the sure. relationships that were going on and all that kind of That's great. boring stuff but yeah. what we got to do each day was really cool because we we're abseiling we we're out in the country we we're yeah all kinds of different places or I remember one day we got to blow up a service station, like a gas station. Like which, legit? Yeah. Blew it up? Yeah. This is like your, your original passions of lighting shit on fire coming into yeah, your actual exactly. work life. I should have become a special effects person. Yeah, that would have been cool. Um, so that was cool. I spent two weeks with them uh, and got put with the assistant directors just by chance. I thought I was going to be in the locations department. I arrived first day and they're like, oh, you'll be bored with us. We're almost finished because they're halfway through the third season. Mm-hmm. Um, the locations manager drove me straight to set and said, here, go with the assistant directors. They always seem pretty busy and they'll have some fun stuff for you to do. Uh, so I spent two weeks with them and um, following that, I actually got offered a job um, pretty soon after on that, that same show. So uh, it was really by chance that you got into assistant directing and, and into yeah, that totally. position. Yeah. They just kind of threw you there and you're like, oh, I, cool. I, I was still saying, I'm, I'm not sure what I want to do. I don't, I, I don't think I understand a big film set well enough to decide and say, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. So. so so, explain a little bit about what, what an assistant director does. Sure. So you've got the first assistant director who's the boss of the set. Um, so they manage the set for the director. They take as much pressure off the director as possible they kind of they'd be like the hard ass where they the director can be nice and then this guy comes in and then yeah to an extent they're working as a team sure um and there's the producer there as well but the first ad is responsible to keep the the film on schedule on track 
they uh, make the schedule to begin with um, so they know exactly what shots and what scenes are being shot on what days and where we're going and that kind of stuff. Um, so they just keep everybody in line on set. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you've got a second assistant director who's predominantly off set. Um, they're planning for the next day with the call sheet um, and also getting everybody through hair, makeup, um, costume and all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're slightly offset and a bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in America, you call it a second second um, assistant director. In Australia, we call it a third assistant director. And they're kind of the right-hand man for all women for the first assistant director. Okay. Um, and part and- of my role has been directing all the extras. So it's always fun when you have a big crowd scene and keeping everybody in line. And Yeah, yeah I always wonder that. It's like whenever yeah. you look at the big crowd, you're like, this is... Not- somebody that like has worked on small sets, but not the big stuff. And you're just like every single person in the shot is no, is that like, this is not just a yeah. random person walking by. Yeah. Like everything is cor- and everything is choreographed pretty tightly yeah, too. to an extent. To an extent. It's yeah. kind of hard when you've got 500 people <laughs> and it just turns into chaos. Right. There were some big scenes on Pirates of the Caribbean, which just got released. And one of, one of the days we had, I think it was 600 extras, 50 stunties and it was just mental holy shit so we had a cannon that was firing we had uh explosions that were happening all kinds of things going on and trying to keep a handle on 600 people so you have a monitor are you and are you kind of like just looking all right and then i've seen some old uh shots and behind the scenes of i forget just like an old school film where the extras had numbers yeah. And then they would, yeah. Did you guys still do that? Where like people would have numbers and you yell at them like, hey, eight. <laughs> uh, I try to get to know names. I find numbers are a little bit uh, impersonal. <laughs> sure, a little and bit. If you can remember a number, you can remember a name. Yeah. Um, and often after working for years, you get to know the extras quite well. Oh, okay. So maybe the industry is smaller in Sydney and the Gold Coast in Australia, but you, you get to know who these people are and who you can rely on and who to avoid and that yeah. kind of stuff. Have you seen um, Ricky Gervais extras? Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's literally my life some days. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. so funny. Like, I got to rewatch that. It's been a while. Yeah. But one thing we do do with the numbers, so every extra does have a number and I take photos and we map out. So say it's a uh-huh. scene that we're shooting today and tomorrow or sometimes it's today and then in four weeks time at a different location on the stage if you're at a location. Um and map out and write exactly where they are. So when you come back to it, because I can't remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we can pull it up and go, okay, you were standing there, you were standing there. We didn't use you and all that kind of stuff. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah. you, you can't have an extra in a prominent place yeah. and, and, and have them in another prominent place in yeah. another scene that exactly. somebody might see and be like, wait a minute. And we shoot out so out of order. It's like yeah. we may shoot something on day one and then be come, back, come back to it on day 60 and if you've got photos, you can be like, wait a second, you can't be here. You died in the film 20 <laughs> days ago. Things like that. Like we had that in oh Hacksaw. It's like yeah. because there was uh, three distinct battles that we talked about, we killed a lot of people in the first battle. And so we had to track whether people were still alive or alive not. Who was dead. And there's a certain amount of cheating you can get away with because everybody looked like an American soldier, really. Sure. But, but if it's like a prominent death, yeah, if exactly. it's one of those deaths where like in uh, Saving Private Ryan, where a dude yeah. gets shot in the head. Yeah, all then- the all the stunties particularly, we had to track that because they would be front and center doing an explosion or getting shot or having some squibs explode on them. So wow. yeah, we just had to be careful. That's cool. Is that what you've done on pretty much every of these big shoots? Is the... the- yeah, when I started extras. out, I, wa- I wasn't so much. I was mm-hmm. more just an on-set PA, and that's kind of you're responsible for making sure the cast are in the right place and, and locking down areas and, and just doing all the minor jobs. But yeah, as, sure. as the years have progressed, yeah. Did you have somebody to help you that like yeah, kind of totally. guided yeah. you? Yeah, it wasn't and... me and 600 extras on that day. Um, sure. Like I'm also reporting to the first AD who's talking to the second second, and then I was the third on that show. And then we on that day, we probably had 15 ad's helping with that amount of um, i just don't understand i mean really in a lot of ways it's like uh it's a it's a business it's a corporation it's like there's a hierarchy in terms of how companies are structured in the same way that film is yeah but although with film is it always the same crews or a lot of the crews overlap with each other or is it like you may show up and it's totally different 
No, I'd say particularly on films in Australia um, because there's only so many big projects going on at the same time. Uh, I would often work with the same people. It, it would probably be 60, 70% of the same crew. And some people might have gone on a holiday, so they're not doing that project and people come and go and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah, it, yeah I got to know them really well. Like they were my film family. Uh, how do you then continue along to that? That seems like a big jump from working on channel nine to working on Mad Max. That's a huge, um, uh, it's, it's all doing the same thing. It's just that the scale of it gets smaller and bigger depending on what it is. Same um, problems, but just, yeah, exactly. Scope. And the bigger the film is, the more help you have. So it's kind of, there's a little bit less pressure and you have more time as well. Your, your schedule's more padded out and you're only shooting a couple of minutes a day. Whereas on mm. rescue, we were shooting up to 10 minutes a day. So I was just frantic all day long, not knowing what I was doing. Cause it was my first job. Wow. And That's I a would, lot. 10 minutes a day. Holy shit. How many was, episodes did they shoot? Uh, we did 22 episodes in that Damn, series. So, That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was mental. And like, I just got through in the deep end and, I didn't know what I was doing. The crew really looked after me and they really, they tested me. And yeah. I, I work with some of the people still that I did that first job with. And they're like, oh, you're getting better at this now. Oh, really? <laughs> like That's six great. years later, I'd hope I was. But. Yeah. So you have some people that kind of took you under their wing. Yeah. To, to oh, hundred percent. Yeah. You, you always need that. You need people that are going to teach you because it's the only way that I think you learn in yeah. the film industry. You make mistakes and people show you what you should have done. And also just watching people and what they do. So yeah, I think there's a there's a balance. Like for me, from an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial aspect of, of um, starting my own business, it was I had my sister who was a mentor to me. She did. Uh, she was a graphic designer, ran her own business, and then it's like if I would get into situations where I didn't know what to do with a client, I didn't know how to charge. Like he asked me for a price, I don't know what to charge for this. Like, there's like a thousand different questions that come up over yeah. the course of like your first couple years of, of exactly. doing something like that. But then also books as well were kind of my, like books like this, books, yeah. uh, a lot of Seth Godin books, a lot of books that just get you in the right mindset because it can be lonely sometimes. You can feel like you're you're kind of in this by yourself. Yeah. Um, and I imagine, so you have people above you that are helping you out, but at the same time, there aren't always people at your level that are doing the same thing where you can kind of be like, hey man, this is kind of tough. <laughs> like, yeah. this, this is a lot to get your head around in the first exactly. day. Yeah, exactly. Um, so after Channel 9, where did it go from there? Uh, so I finished that show and I really hit nothing. I was like, okay, everybody else went and continued on and got the next job. I, I missed out on the next drama because I was inexperienced. Mm. Um, they hired somebody that was experienced and they took the role that I would be doing. Um, so I remember not knowing what to do for, it, was, it ended up being a couple of months and I did a couple of commercials and bits and pieces here and there or additional days on certain shows. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't sure what to do, to be honest. And then randomly out of the blue, your phone just rings. And it's like, hey, we've got this show. Do you want to come and interview for it? Or they might offer you the job there and then because they know who you are and who you work with. Um, so I ended up doing two short stints on some small Australian films uh, as the runner, which is like a production assistant based in the office. Mm -hmm. A lot of driving, picking up things, very minimal, just random tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and then out of that, while I was waiting, I got offered The Great Gatsby with a couple of the people that I've, I'd worked with previously. And so that just blew my mind. Yeah, that like, must have hey, been Hey, come insane. in and have an interview. Because you always hear rumors and whispers of what film's coming up. It's sure. like, who do you know is on it? How do I get an in? Who do I email? Yeah, and you're trying to get that inside knowledge. And it just popped up out of nowhere. And I went into an, for an interview. And I can't remember if they offered me it there or it might have been a few days later. And I started probably a week later. Wow. So. Was, yeah. was the film already underway? No. Yeah. So they were in pre-production. I, yeah. I think I did about six weeks of pre-production, which was really good because it allowed me to get to know a lot of people mm -hmm. instead of just day one on set, like all the pressures on you already. Um, so I remember setting up the office for the assistant directors and, mm -hmm. and reading the script and, and getting to know everybody, which was really so cool. So you, did you know when you went into the interview how big this film actually was? Did, I don't know if there was much talk about it beforehand. I, I knew how big it was. I knew it was a big film that was shooting in Sydney, but yeah. I didn't understand what a Baz Luhrmann film is like because everything's just over the top and amazing and yeah. fun and crazy. That's crazy. And really hard work. A, a cool story that I'll tell you from, I think it was either day two or day three. I was just a random guy that whatever job they needed done, I would just get thrown in there. It's like, push this TV from here to there or go and set this office up. Mm -hmm. I'd just get the random jobs. 
and we were, uh, it was shot all in 3D. So um, Baz had never shot in 3D for a feature before. So it was a, something new for him. So we did a lot of camera tests. Day three, I'm there and they're like, um, we need somebody to do the acting for the 3D test. And it, it wasn't acting. It was literally just like, pick this up, pick that up, move here, come and hit this mark, wait there, look over here. There was no lines or anything yeah. like that. Um, and they're like, Matt, do that. So day three, I'm there <laughs> being directed by Baz in this no camera shit. test, testing 3D camera rigs that most of the crew had never used before. Yeah. And I was just like, wow. I just went home going, that was an amazing experience. That's fucking so cool. Yeah, so that was cool. I had, a, I had a, this is like a lower level. So this is like my <laughs> like lower level version of that. So I did a lot of work early on with uh, music videos with this company called Robot Films. They did a lot of hip hop music videos. And uh, we're at this like overnight shoot and it's a party scene. And then there is this one scene and I'm like, I guess you could call me. I was just like almost like an assistant slash I was shooting some behind the scenes footage as well as kind of just getting a feel for it. I was almost like an apprentice of this company because like uh, I was connected with the owner and the director. And then um, I was trying to help them. They were shooting a silhouette scene where there's like a sexy woman like dancing with this guy. And then... um, they, the guy, like, basically, they didn't look right. They were right next to each other, but for some reason, the silhouette looked different. So yeah. we needed the guy to come forward a little bit, a little bit away from the girl. And then uh, I, I kept trying to, like, I was, like, helping them tweak. And then, like, you know, Matt, why don't you just get in there? And why don't you why don't you be the guy in the silhouette? Yes. <laughs> Which I probably had this, like, mushroom haircut. <laughs> like, it probably showed up in the sh- in the uh, the silhouette. And then it was the most awkward thing ever. Like, I'm, I'm in college, and I'm, like, kind of dorky and... and um, not confident at all. And here is this like voluptuous woman who's like half naked and she's like touching my face <laughs> and she's like getting real seductive with me. I know. And, I, I'm, and like, we, we both were like, this is the most awkward thing that we've ever been through. Um, but that was, uh, that was similar. It wasn't, yeah. I don't think it was on the scale. So intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Baz would be like, Matt, move these books from there to there. I yeah. remember it was all about books. I'd it rather was, do that. It was about Toby Maguire's scene where he unpacks his house next to Gatsby's mansion. And Baz is giving me direction. I'm like, <laughs> just okay, like terrified. Sure. And like, they're like, now do it quicker. I'm like, do it exactly the same. I'm like, I'm not an actor. Yeah, I'm yeah. just intimidated by this entire scene. Well, you know what though? You give actors a lot more credit for what they do. Yeah. Like, holy fuck. I can't do that. That's, that's a, like to, to be able to, it's not just expressing the right emotion, but it's doing it under the context where if you fuck up, you're costing us money. Yeah. Um, and being confident yeah. they need to be so confident in front of the entire crew because the crew's just standing there going hurry up I want to go home we're in our 15th hour you're taking too many takes yeah <laughs> yeah, like, yeah 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 they need they, to turn it on there they, and then they gotta get it especially if it's like a scene where it's emotional yeah. or it's like has, you know, that's, that's where it gets kind of crazy um, that's such a cool story though and then Great Gatsby that, how long does that show run for uh, the, the movie? I think that was about eight months I spent on that mm-hmm. six to eight months um, it was incredible like every day was incredible I wasn't waking up dreading going to work at all but uh, that's all I did was go to work for yeah. eight months straight oh, that's tough for the personal yeah. life huh yeah so I was newly married my wife and I got married very very young um so this was the first big job of my career and she was extremely supportive. Like Jen was amazing mm-hmm. through that. I, I remember I would wake up, brush my teeth, go to work or have a shower, brush my teeth, go to work, come home, have a shower, brush my teeth, go to sleep. That's all I did oh, holy because shit. I was just exhausted. Every meal. You know, you know they're long, long, they're long days when you have two showers a day. <laughs> <laughs> just cause you get so sweaty. Yeah. You 15 hours a day. Like, yeah. It's tough. But at the same time, the energy that Baz brings to set and what we were, were creating was just phenomenal and so cool that's and, why and when it becomes so important right to have leaders that are exactly you know, and like he that. doesn't just boss people around he inspires you to be a part of making his film which is so cool yeah um, so how does he do that he brings you on he sells the vision to you so he's the only director that i've met that actually sat down with his crew of it was probably two to three hundred people i remember on the sound stage and he played us a 10 minute rough cut of what he wanted the film to be with all different visual elements that he'd thrown together some rough visual effects mock-ups or um, storyboards and all kinds of stuff and and the soundtrack the music and he shows you exactly what he wants the film to be and so you become a part of it rather than just there's the script read it 
we'll go and make it. Right. That's so important because I, I will do that oftentimes, especially if it's small stuff. I, I try to infuse a little bit of that, but I think that's like a reminder to um, to make people a part of it, to let yeah. them know why we're shooting these interviews, not to just show up and hit record. Because yeah. that like people need to feel like they actually are excited about the project. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of times, um, especially when you're working on small budget stuff, you have to inspire people beyond money. Yeah. Like a couple hundred dollars for a day if it's a small project is like nobody's going to be excited about that. But can you get somebody excited about the vision of what you yeah. can potentially create together? Exactly. Um, I imagine working on a project that big, that early in your career gives you a lot of street cred and a lot of, it allows you to kind of move to another big project. It's like you've gotten legitimate experience now. Yeah. And I think it came down to who I worked with, but it, it wasn't, people weren't then looking at my resume being like, oh, wow, he worked on The Great Gatsby. He must be amazing. Yeah. They look at who you worked with. So I continued to work with the same assistant directors for the next, well, six years until I moved over here. So you you did well in your role so they decided yeah, to keep you on yeah and, exactly um so as long as you can do the well uh, you, you can do the job well and uh you show up on time and you're easy to work with it, it, whatever you've learned in that six months like you become so close to people you know exactly what they they need like i know when i walk into uh into work in that morning how to get my boss going how to mm -hmm. make their coffee the best coffee mm -hmm. when to get them breakfast when to not talk to them because they're in their own headspace and, and just judging that person and, and having that relationship so the next film they take you on to you've already established that so yeah it's even smoother not everybody's good at that though i think it, it does require yeah. like reading people and and, yeah. and and having some social wit <laughs> and not yeah not and, and look some people won't get along with some people and they might both be really good at their job, but their personalities just clash. So they won't want to do other jobs with each other. But. Yeah. What advice would you give somebody that's, that's kind of going down that route of, of just starting uh, one of these gigs for the first time? They're on set for the very first time. Work hard and go the extra mile. So and how do you do that? Uh, it starts by showing up early. So if I know my call time is six o'clock, I'll get there at 5.30, mm -hmm. maybe 5.45, but yeah at least 15 minutes before so i can come in i can put my bag down i put my radio on i read the call sheet i read the sides if i need to uh which are like little script sides for what i'm shooting that day um and so i'm prepared so at six o'clock when i need to be on or even before that i'm ready to go to work and i know exactly what what is going on rather than somebody that walks in at six o'clock puts their bag down and is still a mess at six o'clock and and not knowing what they're doing mm -hmm. um so that's the first thing, just starting your day early and getting on top and also prepping the people above you. It's all about hierarchy in the film industry. So it's like, I know who is directly my supervisor. So I need to make sure they're set up for their day of work and I need to make sure the next boss and the next mm -hmm. boss is all set up. So it's like, if I've got that extra 15 minutes, I make sure either their desk is tidy if you're off set or going onto set, making sure they've got everything they need. For me, it's the stand-ins, having them there straight away and prepped on the day and knowing what we're going to start with making sure everybody's had breakfast and coffee like food and coffee mm -hmm. it's, it's all about that when it's, you're starting in the out. film industry it's yeah, all, totally. it is all about the food though too making sure the crew is fed and, and, oh 100 percent. yeah because we work long days and i get hangry very quickly <laughs> yeah i think everybody does <laughs> yeah, right so. but that, that's amazing advice i think nobody has ever gotten in trouble for showing up early no. And I think that's good advice for like anybody, any role you're going to be in, show up early yeah. and just be prepared and ready to go. And yeah. especially like we're talking about in these big film roles, it, it starts at the beginning of the day. Because if you show up late, if you don't have the, you know, what do you call them? The fill-ins or the stand-ins. The stand-ins. If you don't have the stand-ins ready to go, then it's going to slow everything else down. Everybody's going to be waiting on you. And then if if, yeah. if a lot of people are, are behind a little bit, it probably pushes everything back. And yeah. then if you... You know, if it, it really sometimes is a matter of like probably five to 10 minutes on some of these shoots where you're like, we just need five minutes to get this one last scene, but we can't do it because we're going into overtime and then we're going to go over budget and then we're yeah. not going to be able to do it. Have you ever had a, with these big budget things, I was just talking to my buddy uh, with the pilot and he said they had to cut scenes. They had to cut a couple of scenes because they were like, we don't have time for it. We can't do it. It's going to be yeah. out of budget. Does that happen with the big, big stuff or do they generally... They make everything work. Uh, it's above my pay grade, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Like I see script amendments happen and I know when we've dropped scenes off days and whether we pick that up or not. Um, but that's really for the producer, the director and the first AD to 
I don't have any. You don't know why <laughs> they might be cut off. Why well, sometimes I know. Yeah, sometimes yeah. we're just shooting too slowly or it might have rained on us all day long and that kind of stuff. Um, like changing the script to like last minute. Yeah, or yeah. deciding, well, we don't really need that scene, uh, but the director might fight for it. So we'll swap some days of the schedule. around. The, the schedule constantly changes. Like yeah. it, it's forever being tweaked and adjusted and uh, depends on the writer and the director relationship as well. Like Baz writes a lot of his own stuff. So amendments would come out almost daily. Oh, but, really? <laughs> well, let's say weekly, but that was a lot of amendments. But then yeah. you can work on something else where the writer is the writer and the director is the director. So it's pretty set in concrete mm-hmm. what they're doing. And it's like, you just have to capture those scenes on the day. So. Yeah. And um, I, th- I think a big part of it is like, you have problems that, that arise, right? Yeah. And, then, and it's just trying to figure out the quickest, so, most so effective So many way. problems. Right. You would like not the, believe what happens. Yeah. You, <laughs> you can't, even on a small scale, you can't have a shoot where one thing, where everything goes right. There's always yeah. at least one thing and it's usually multiple things that yeah. go wrong and you're it's always... It's generally weather. Weather. Yeah. It happens to weather. I've, uh, we've dealt with weather in all kinds of... I've like mopped mud off a muddy ground just to make it look dry really <laughs> like just some yeah. of the stuff you find yourself doing to to overcome these obstacles is just ridiculous like who mops mud and then throws sand on it for one take and then has to do it all over again oh, rather geez. than just going oh it's raining we'll give up and yeah. come back to it you just don't have the time or you the can't. luxury to do that yeah so. um do you ever did you ever find yourself early on and even now doing things that were outside of the scope of your role that you shouldn't have been doing where uh, sometimes as I've gone from being a one man run and gun do everything audio video interviews like do it all to getting to a point where you have I have a crew usually with the doc stuff it's like five or six seven people um, knowing that wait, like I shouldn't be slating in this interview because I'm directing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, do you ever get to a point I, like that? Yeah, sometimes. You've, you've definitely got to know on the larger films where there's people to do everything. There's people to hand you food. There's people to pick up that shot bag. You, you leave it to them. It's like, I don't come and wipe the windscreen of a car because either the vehicles department or the props department do that and I'm doing their job if I do that. Yeah. And some people get a little bit funny about that you're not so allowed it, to really cross certain yeah, lines with the camera department you can't touch a camera yeah, exactly <laughs> there's certain things where on some days if somebody's struggling you're going to help them lift up their cases or push yeah. their trolleys or that kind of stuff um but you know what your role is I, I do remember early on in my career i got into trouble by a boss uh because i made a phone call to somebody that i wasn't supposed to speak to just because they were up the top of the chain and I was right down the bottom mm. and I thought I was helping trying to set a meeting up but apparently it said in a course of events that I wasn't supposed to be a part of oh really no <laughs> so shit I, I just got told where my place was which yeah. wasn't a negative thing I didn't get yelled at or anything she's just said make sure you come through me every time you're going to do something like that so that was just a learning curve what was the next film after uh, Gatsby so I took a little bit of a holiday after Gatsby, which yeah, was please. nice. Yeah, you need that, man. <laughs> which was you, really cool. You, yeah, you take well, a honeymoon? <laughs> uh, well, we actually, we did six weeks around Europe, so that was pretty good. Oh, that's so great. Jen got the reward for me working and being away for so long. Oh, that's nice. Um, and then uh, went straight on to Mad Max, uh, which was really cool. And that was still in pre-production, quite early pre-production, um, based in Sydney, and they were about to film uh, in Namibia and Cape Town in South Africa. So... It was a different role for me. It was office-based rather than mm. on set. Um, so that was good, seeing the other parts of it all get made. And then the crew flew over to Africa and I continued to work uh, in the office as like logistical support. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a very, it was a very random role for me. It wasn't really putting into practice what I'd learned from Gatsby, but I was seeing a whole other side of things. It was actually a really cruisy job, which was nice to yeah. just have a little bit of a break and... and see Jen a little bit more and that kind of stuff. It can be tough to, yeah. to, to balance. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. And it's it's not like you can, there's a recipe where you, you figure it out and then, all right, yeah. now my life's good. I have a perfect balance between my personal life, work life, relationships, exactly. friends, all that stuff. It's like constantly, it's if, always constantly out of balance yeah. and you're just trying to bring it back into. If you're working in film, it's never a nine to five. You're going to work 20 hour days for six months and then you're going to have six months off or something yeah. like that. It's like so. being a pilot. 
in a lot of yeah, ways. That's yeah. what they do. They you do like three months on, it. three months off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is tough. It can be hard on families and relationships and, and friends. So something that you've got to be aware of going into it. Are you prepared to kind of give up social life for four or five months if that's a project or I've lived yeah. away from home for six months once um, doing a film that was out of state. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a challenge and, and it's been great that Jen is so relaxed and encouraging of that and she can handle it. I just told Nat recently because I decided to uh, stop, at least for the time being, client work uh, to focus on original projects because I just mm -hmm. like, while that's my real only source of income besides like uh, minimalism, like we get a little bit coming in here and there from that. But I was like, I can't, if I want to focus on creating original content on this podcast, on doing all this stuff, I cannot continue to do this. So I'm like, Nat, just want to let you know, you might have to be the breadwinner for a little bit. Like you may have to pick up the slack yeah. because I'm not going to be making a lot of money over the next year. Because I want to yeah. like really, you got to give yourself some time to be able to do that stuff. And exactly. uh, she's just been incredibly supportive. But you need that. You need yeah. you need to be able to have people that, that have your and back. It's, and it's about picking the right times. If you just had young children, you probably wouldn't go and put that pressure on your family. But yeah. right now you can do it. So yeah, exactly. It's, a good time. Uh, it's kind of one project to the next. Is that how it usually is yeah. in, in the film industry? Yeah, like and it's, not... it's always, that's always the scary thought because you can be coming up to finishing a project uh, and you have nothing on the horizon. And I remember like uh, Jen and I bought a property back in Sydney uh, almost three years ago now. And it was scary because my work contracts could sometimes be eight weeks long and then I would have nothing after yeah. that. But you've just got to trust that the next project comes around. Like we're always making TV shows and films. So there'll be work there. You've just got to go out and get it. So. In the beginning for me, it's like you have to say yes to pretty much everything. I mean, I think most people do. It's like if you don't have yeah. any experience, you got to say yes to a lot. Yeah. But then eventually once you get going and you build up some experience, you have to be more selective. And especially when you're working on an eight-month project, six-month project, you can't just hop into the next film just for the money. Yeah. You know, because if, if you got a project opportunity you take that, you are, you're saying no to everything else for the next six to eight months. And sometimes projects will turn out to be completely different to what you expect. So you might think you're doing it just for money because they offered you a promotion and better money or something like that. And you just need it to pay bills at this time. But you might meet a director you get along really well with if you're an up and coming DP and end up doing a project with them. Or you might work with somebody that takes you and does some other projects or, or all kinds of stuff. Or you might just make some good friends over that yeah. time. So it's, yeah, it's interesting how some projects I've started them thinking I was either doing it for the promotion or that role. And then it turns out to be something else. Was there any points where you felt like I'm not ready for this? Holy shit. Like every job. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Like, because you're constantly taking on more responsibility with each project. So you always feel out of your comfort zone and out of, out of depth. It's like, I think probably after two years of working as a third assistant director, I did a project and went, wow, I actually feel comfortable in my role. I feel mm. like I, I'm actually having some good input on this film rather than just being frantic all day long <laughs> and going home and like just getting as much sleep as possible and coming back the next day with the best attitude because Again, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. Um, you build up some confidence in, yeah. in, in what you're doing. And yeah, you're like, exactly. actually, I'm bringing something to the table. Yeah, like, and then you start to mentor the people below you. You mm. might get given a PA on a, on a job or a young camera assistant or something that you can give a few tips to or just kind of encourage because you can see that they're not getting enough sleep and they're emotional and broken. And <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They might have a hard boss that's yelling at them for no apparent reason just to test who they are, but you can be like, dude, it's okay. Oh, you'll, really? you'll get through it. It's like or, a frat. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, some um, rites of passage. I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> uh, it, w it was uh, pushing yourself out of your, your comfort zone. And, oh, yeah. and, and I wonder if there is any specific things that come to mind in terms of um, either films or or specific scenes where it was like, this is, a bit, yeah. this is a bit much. So Pirates of the Caribbean was probably the scariest project for me. Um, one because it was out of state so I had to move an hour's flight away to the Gold Coast from Sydney I mm. knew it was a long project it was six months living away from home um, and I knew it was going to be a big project and just a challenge um, for what I was going to do and it was a great crew like I knew the crew really well and everybody supported each other um, and I actually ended up living in an apartment with 
the guy, his name's Chris Turner. He was who I got put with work experience on that very first uh, job I did on Rescue Special Ops oh, get out and here. took his role. So we've always worked together really <laughs> yeah. well, but that kind of uh, solidified that relationship where we actually lived together for six months. That's cool, man. Uh, and became really good buddies. Um, but that film scared me. And, and initially when I heard it was getting made, I was like, I don't want to move to the Gold Coast. I don't want to do that project. I'm comfortable in Sydney. I'm happy here. Everybody mm-hmm. else will go away and I'll take their jobs in Sydney. It'll be great. Sure. Um, and I spoke to a mentor of mine. Uh, it doesn't work in film. He just kind of helps me through various things professionally. Um, and he said, just go and do it. I was like, why? I don't want to. He's like, it'll be great for you. Just mm-hmm. go and do it. And so I called them back up and said, hey, I'll take that job. Mm. Um, and then there's a whole process to that. you got to negotiate and nothing was sure until I actually got there really. Mm-hmm. Um, but he just pushed me that little bit even though I w- didn't want to do it. And I, I never regretted it. Jen and I did fine. Our relationship was fine. We flew back and forth. Um, what was it an hour I, flight? Yeah, it was yeah. an hour flight. So I was sick of going to the airport. We, we'd do fortnightly. So I Jen would come up or I'd go down and... Yeah, you, well, you're lucky it wasn't in the States because I've traveled between like Sydney and, and Melbourne and it, dude, it's so easy. You yeah. literally just like walk through, the, it's like a bus terminal. Yeah, They're, but on your day off, yeah, yeah, do you no, want to go to the airport and then have like, I think it's 30 hours together and then go back to the airport? Yeah, no. it, it just still gets rough. frustrating. Long distance is really tough, yeah. especially if you have to fly to get, like I've done long distance where you drive five hours, but uh, I think a flight is just like an added stress to yeah. it. But that was an amazing project. I made stronger friends. Um, actually had a good time on the Gold Coast too. Like we were living across the road from the beach. It was that's amazing. amazing. Like yeah, that's I could great. surf on days off and um, it was cool. And then we got to do some amazing scenes like work with the most extras I've ever worked with. There were stunts pretty much every day. Um, yeah, it was really cool. When did you decide to come to New York? Uh, we've always talked about it especially the US. We weren't sure about LA or New York um, for probably five years now. So pretty early on in our careers, we're like, let's go over to the US at some stage. It always appealed to us. Yeah. Uh, my wife works in advertising, so there's bigger industries here. We want to learn from bigger and bigger people, people that have worked on the best projects and uh, the best companies, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it just took us a while to get here. Um, we actually won the green card lottery, which was insane so <laughs> what is the green card lottery i don't know this. uh so there's certain countries around the world that can enter this lottery each year for free um and they they say they just draw your name out of a hat pretty mm-hmm. much um and when your name comes up you've got about 12 months you get processed as a visa and you get a green card so we're on an unrestricted green card for 10 years and then we can renew what? it yeah that's insane i didn't know that <laughs> yeah that's so, amazing yeah so, i should tell natalie to submit to that <laughs> yeah exactly so for people in fi- in the film oh. industry that want to work in la uh, it's a great avenue it just takes time it took us yeah. four years of entering to actually oh win you it. did okay yeah but i've heard of people winning it in their first year i've heard of people second and third years it just took us a little while so yeah that, that yeah well i mean as somebody who, who does something that, that's more freelance that's like really important you both got it though at the same time. So or? Jen won it, but because we're married, I, I get, get it as well. Here. So that's yeah, so yeah. cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I have to like marry Natalie now to like yeah. <laughs> so she can stay. But even that is not like a we we're, we're no, looking it's still into a it. Process. Yeah, you, like they give you uh, I think like temporary for a year. She can stay, and then she has to go through the application process. Yeah. To, it's a it's a long process. This, this if your name comes up, it's probably the easiest way to get into the US. I'm gonna tell her. But yeah. Although it's, since she's here, I don't know if she can do it because she's can on. Still do it. She's yeah. on a visa. She can yeah, still do you it. Can still do it. Yeah, I don't know. So, She's been sleeping on that. I need yeah. to get her to. It's get, it's pretty, and it's free it's cool. to enter. You've got nothing to lose. Oh, really? Yeah. What do you it's do? Just you just really go to a website and yeah, it's pop like DV diversity. Uh, it's called the Diversity Green Card or something like that. Mm. It's just a website that you enter between October and November, and then you find out in May. So the interesting thing was, it always came out on the second of May. I think it's or very early May and Jen's birthday, the 1st of May. So she'd have a really good birthday, but she'd be like, I wonder if I've got the green card this year. And then it would come out and I'd be like, I oh, didn't get it. Did you guys lose your <laughs> shit when you found out that you yeah. got it? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty nuts. Yeah, so I checked my name first and I didn't get it. And we're like, oh, here we go. Another year of disappointment. And then we checked Jenny's and like her face was just like, oh my God, what do I do now? Like, and she just started calling people. I had to go to work. <laughs> so <laughs> what, I was what like, movie oh, were you working on then? I can't even remember. 
I'm not sure. So you had yeah. the, you, you, like, so. Oh no, it was alien. Sorry, I do remember. Oh, no, sure. Yeah, it was alien. Cause I went to work. I was like, guys, we're moving to the U S we just won the green card. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Cause they, not only do you win that, how exciting is it? But then you're like, well now we should, we should probably move. Right. Yeah. So it takes time. Mm-hmm. We found out in May. We got processed in October and then we moved in February wow. the following that's year. Exciting. So, that's exciting. Yeah. It's crazy because that's why I say you can't really make plans for the future. Like you can like a little bit and you can yeah. have an idea of where you want to go. But at the same time, you have no idea where you're going to be. In yeah. And then we had to decide between Los Angeles or New York. There were our two options. We could have gone anywhere. Yeah. Um, but that were the two I mean, places we decided. And right. If you're coming to the States, you want to... Yeah, you're not you're not coming to live in Montana. <laughs> yeah, well, Atlanta is another option for us uh, because of the with, film industry there. Yeah. But I just didn't want to live there, and I felt like then we'd just be moving for my work. Whereas New York was a happy medium for both of us. Yeah, good industries for both of us. A crazy, exciting city. A big challenge. So, how do you yeah. like it so far? It's been tough. It's tough. Yeah. <laughs> It's been hard. This is a really, really hard transition. Actually, the original name of the podcast was going to be How to Make It in New York. Because oh, I just... It shouldn't be the name of my one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, how do you like, like stay flowing? You just cross out New York and write <laughs> Sydney. And then... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the, the, How it, to Move to New York instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the, that's the, the thing is that... Uh, you you can't really make it in New York. And, and it's it's like I'm just befuddled at every time that I see people moving to New York and I'm like how are you doing that a lot of people are like living in with six people in Bushwick in a two yeah. bedroom apartment and that's the only way they can do it yeah. like because that's the big thing that a lot of people in New York they're like oh so what do you pay for rent what's your rent and everybody wants to know it's yeah like, where do you live people what's your rent? work ask me that they're like how much is your rent and I tell them like oh you're paying way too much I'm like yeah but you live two hours out of the city like yeah. I live on Manhattan so. yeah not only so I, I was just talking to a realtor from LA and I was like I was put in touch with him from a friend and he's kind of give, telling me a little bit about it. He's like, what do you want? What do you like? What are your requirements? Like I gave him this, this is our budget. This is kind of what we're thinking about. Uh, he said, okay, cool. I'm going to send you over about 10, 15 places. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like, does this cost anything? Like, do I have to pay you a fee or a realtor fee or anything like that? He's like, no, what are you talking about? Yeah. I was like, in New York, you have to pay a realtor. Fee. He's like a, a, broker's, real, fee. a broker's fee. Yeah. I was like, yeah, sometimes it's 10% of your yearly rent. Yeah, 10 to we, 15%. It's insane. so much money because rent is so high. Yeah. Um, and like, for me, I was lucky that it was just one month, which is like 2,500 bucks, which is still a lot of money. You're just, yeah. that money's gone. That's yeah. not something you get back. For nothing. You do, yeah, for nothing, for absolutely nothing. You you do that, and then you have to pay an actual security deposit of twenty five hundred first month, last month. That's like over ten grand to yeah. move into a place. Yeah, it's crazy. Exactly. Um, and then not only that, but the fact that to I was like, so do these places just go like that? Because you you have to show up like with money <laughs> to these places in order yeah. to get. Did you guys have a tough time finding a place in New York, or was it? That was actually one of the easiest thing, which yeah. was phenomenal. Um, because that was, a job and a house. That's what you're scared of when you're moving. Like as long as you can sort out those two things, you can do anything. Like you can find friends, you can whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But the house we locked in uh, probably two months before we moved, which I was so stoked about because it just took that pressure off us. Um, And it it came out of nowhere. It's a Um, Mm sublease. There's an amazing group on Facebook called the Australians in New York. Australians Uh, take care of each other. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's incredible. Um, there's about 10,000 members in it and people post up places that they're renting out, subleasing, if somebody's moving out and they're breaking their lease, trying to get new tenants, all that kind of stuff. But it's more than that as well. It's not just housing, it's recommendations for places to eat, it's jobs are getting advertised. Jen's phone got stolen on the weekend, uh, which was a bummer. And she posted on the, hey, does anybody have an old iPhone that I can either borrow or have for a little Mm -hmm. while just until I can figure out what's going on. And immediately people were like, yeah, you can have this iPhone, you can have that iPhone, come and pick it up. So she picked up an iPhone like that day (laughs) and they were like, yeah, whatever, I don't need it, you can have it. So it's amazing. Yeah, it's this amazing community that just helps each other out. That's great. And yeah, that's actually probably how Natalie got her first apartment and an affordable apartment at that. She was subletting for like 900 some bucks a month, which is like, it's really hard to get a place for like around $900 for one person. Um, She was living with roommates, but that, that, 
kind of community. It's it's nice to have that when you yeah. come over because you do in a way, even though you may not know these people personally, you know that you can fall back on that. Yeah, exactly. Have. If you need help or advice. And at the same time, like if people are asking questions about the green card lottery, like Jen or I try and answer those questions and help people out. So yeah, it comes great. full circle. But yeah, great. we ended up with this awesome one bedroom place in West Village. Um, amazing little neighborhood. It's kind of amazing. Like, jen's dream street to live on to begin with so i'm like we're, we're living in manhattan in your dream street to start with like that's pretty cool yeah so. isn't it weird to think that like just one day you're you're in city the next day you're living in manhattan it's kind of like yeah. surreal right yeah and it was like going from summer to winter we lived on the beach to oh, the shit. middle of the city you've never dealt with winter before well have you? it doesn't snow not like city. a real winter yeah <laughs> this is <laughs> natalie's it like it's it, cold but yeah not like this i remember so. natalie's first winter it was january and she's like all right well you know at least it's gonna be warm next month and like no <laughs> maybe like april may like may june like well, even yeah, now we start started june and i'm still waiting for the <laughs> warm weather like, this like, is the summer and then and then it's gonna get so hot that you're gonna be like i'm done with this shit it gets too hot yeah people like start passing out from from heat exhaustion <laughs> uh yeah it's uh, the, that's what i'm actually looking forward to with la it's more of like sydney type yeah, weather which consistent will, which will be nice yeah um do you guys see yourself in New York for, for a bit longer? Uh, yeah. Do you know how long you're... I think it's very early to say. Um, it's been, what, six months or so? Four months. Four yeah. months, yeah. Yeah, so we're still still figuring that out. Um, we definitely like it. It's just a massive challenge. So, um, And the next step for us will be children at some stage in the next few years. So. In New York? Well, that's Maybe. the question, isn't it? <sighs> Don't do it. Can we, <laughs> Don't do can it. we do that? Can we do that without the family support? Yeah, can that's Can we do that's that really with tough. the financial burdens and all that kind of stuff? So yeah. It, um, to me, my the one reason why I would never do that is just watching the people struggling struggling with strollers on the subway and like pulling it up stairs. And I'm like, yeah. never, never, I can't. Do and it. when it's fine and sunny outside, it's it's easy. But when it's snowing outside or when it's raining and what yeah, are you, gonna you do? don't have a car, people and, do it. People do it exactly. So <laughs> I don't know I if that's a reason to do it though, right? If there's a reason for us to stay, we'll do it. Yeah. Say but, some of us, if either of us is doing really well in our jobs or. We feel like we can't move, then mm-hmm. then we'll do it. But come to LA. I don't know yet. And now I'm trying to. Now that I'm moving to LA, I'm oh, trying to get everybody. You're to come one to of LA. those already. <laughs> yeah, come to, yeah. I didn't even move there yet. Yeah, exactly. Come to LA. It's so much better. The weather is nice. The weather. That's all you've got to offer. <laughs> yeah. And the beach. Great traffic. If I there. want weather and the beach, I'll just go home to Sydney. Go home to Sydney. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it, isn't it? I um. Well, that's actually one of the reasons we're moving to LA is that it's closer to Sydney. Yeah. Is that and and even though it's a 14 hour flight. That having done the twenty-five to twenty-seven hour flight is like, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, it's fourteen easy. hours yeah. direct flight. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how it works out. It'll be nice to 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 be able. to A lot of Australians city. do go through LA as well. It's it's very much visited by Australians. So is it? Yeah, yeah. I imagine it would be. Yeah. You guys get a lot of Australians go to London as well. Yeah. That's. I think Australians just go everywhere around the what world. What the hell? It's hard <laughs> to escape Australians. I don't know if it's because we're so isolated that everybody's like, well. I want to get out, so I've got to go somewhere. It doesn't matter how far it is. Mm-hmm. Or I don't know what it is, but yeah, London. But even I was in Whistler in the winter, and that place is just overrun by Australians. Like, Whistler? Where's that? Uh, Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was skiing uh, mm-hmm. in Canada. Um, yeah, it's just... Australians everywhere. Maybe it's, it's because... Here's the thing, though. I never met... I, I only knew a couple Australians. Like I've only met a couple Australians and, and knew one guy from an old job. Uh, but... Natalie was like one of the first Australians that I met. So I think when you are an Australian, yeah. like you like you the, the community, you tend to, to to find each other. But then once that community is opened up, I'm like they're fucking everywhere. Like well, <laughs> Nat and I go we'll go out to dinner, and it's like ten other Australians, yeah. and I'm the only American there. I'm like fuck. I need and you might not notice it, but I'll walk down the street and I'll hear Australians talking because I just recognize their accent. That's true. Immediately, I'm like. I can't escape these people. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? It, who are all these people? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tend to notice it. I, I pick up on it a little bit more yeah. now. But even in LA, you'll have so many people, so many actors trying to make it there. So oh, many really? filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. Australians. In particular. Yeah, probably more Australians in LA. I would imagine I'd than in so. New York. Yeah. Um, just because of the proximity, yeah. it's like probably an easier transition for them. But uh, yeah, I feel like the did you take a year off did did you do that what is it called the the leap year or the gap year gap year did you do that uh i did yeah so that's when i went to colorado uh and spent six months skiing and being an idiot Uh, (laughs) (laughs) having no responsibilities yeah which was that with jen 
No, no, that was with two buddies from school, oh, cool. uh, which was an amazing trip. And it was, I still look back at photos and go, how did we not die? Because really? It's just the dumb stuff we did. Just the jumps that we did and launching off cliffs on our snowboards and super dangerous. Yeah. Just, yeah. Do you still uh, do stuff like that? No, that's, that's why I was in Whistler looking at stuff that <laughs> 10 years ago I would happily do that jump or launch off that cliff. And now I'm looking at it going, what kind of crazy person does yeah. that? Like, I think we're just soft now. <laughs> well, I think, and I, I think it's responsibility. So I look at that jump yeah. and go, I can break my leg. I can break my <laughs> neck. I won't be able to work. Then I can't pay my mortgage. Then Jenny will probably leave me because I'll just be some <laughs> person that's lying in bed doing that's nothing. That's like the saddest thing. Like when you were younger, you would look at that and you would see the potential. Yeah, of- it's like, oh, I can smash that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. If he can do it, I can do it. Let's do it. And then now you now you see your wife leaving you <laughs> when you look at that. Hill. I just look at responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. it's so yeah. true, man. I feel the same exact way. It's like I'm 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 very cautious about um about hurting myself. Like, yeah. like, all right, is my health insurance going to be able to, to pay for this? Like, yeah. am I, if I, if I don't work for the next three to six months, am I going to be like, yeah, is not going to leave It just me? holds you back. It but holds, it holds you that's back. probably a good thing because jumping off cliffs on snowboards isn't the smartest thing. It's not do. sustainable. I don't think. <laughs> and if you're not going to, but it was fun. It yeah, was yeah, fun. Yeah, it was I'm so happy I did it. it. And I became such a good friends with those guys from school. And, um, yeah, we just ran amok because we're 18. Like in Sydney, wow. you can drink and you're considered an adult at 18, but in America, it's 21. So we we're just these young kids that thought we owned the world, but yeah. really we're just... They, we do have that culture here, but it seems to be more prevalent in, yeah. in Australia. It's probably, yeah, it's probably because most Australians are from the East Coast as well. So you've got... Yeah, you don't have... A everybody's big... from Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne, really. So we've all grown up with beaches and mountains and outdoor activities, so... Yeah. Yeah. So getting reestablished in New York has been a challenge. Yeah. What's like the the toughest part about it? I mean, four four months is not a very long time. I think you gotta no, give yourself exactly. a little bit of so credit. So I haven't given up just yet. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I like, I, I, like the, the, there's still an option there to give up. <laughs> yeah. I worked on a pilot here for a couple of weeks or a few weeks. I worked with a producer for a little while. Um, but it just comes down to your network. I, I always knew that I got jobs from people that I knew. It was, I, I never submitted my resume to third assistant director for Pirates of the Caribbean. Like they don't advertise those jobs. Mm-hmm. So it's about building up those networks and people trusting you to give you that job again. Um, so that's and been the biggest challenge, just getting to know as many people as possible that are working in the film industry. Are there many Australians, say, in that, that Facebook group that are in the film industry, or is it is it less? Uh, yeah, there's a few, and I, I've connected with a few. Um, Baz is actually based here now, so I've met with his, uh, his business people and his production company That's people, um, which is cool, and they kind of introduce you to some American people that are working here and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think it just it'll take time. And I probably forget that although I got Gatsby fairly early on. It was still August. So it was almost, it was about 10 months by the time I finished university and started on that job to actually getting a first big job that I was stoked with. Mm -hmm. As much as I was happy with the the TV show and the smaller films, like it took, still took a while to get established. Um, So four months isn't that long. Yeah. And that all, that all it takes is is just to get that one gig in New York to establish yourself. The right person and and then you're in. So yeah. Um, and then it's um so you said you're 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 starting to you want to get into producing a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, so that's the goal. That's always been my aim for the last few years. Um assistant directing is fun and amazing and we've I've been to some awesome locations and worked with some of the best filmmakers in the world, um which was really cool. But I've always wanted to produce. I love crafting stories. I love running a film as a business and like a little startup. Like I'm an entrepreneur at, at uh, at my core so that's mm-hmm. that's what i enjoy doing and that's what i want to pursue more yeah. and more while i'm in new york so would you ever get into directing or do you think i don't really have an interest in it yeah um which is funny to say because people go but you're an assistant director but it's a very <laughs> different mindset sure. and i don't i don't get really excited by directing performance and but you write well is this a different kind of writing for you than, than it's to- very different yeah it's and also, I write it, and then Jen edits it. Oh, Jen edits it. So if you read my book, you'd be bored. Oh, that's amazing. But if you read my book through the eyes of Jenny's rewrites, 
then it's good. Dude, that, that's a true <laughs> partnership right there. Yeah, exactly. So, But how do you motivate your wife to edit your book when she doesn't want to? That's That was the hardest thing. How did you do that? <laughs> you should write a whole book on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just takes time. So everything takes longer than you expect. So it took yeah. about 18 months to, to write that. And wow. it actually started while I was on the Gold Coast, lonely on Pirates. Just with time, I was like, oh, what should I do? And I was constantly training. I'll yeah, I was constantly training production assistants and people that were starting out or would get work experience kids or all kinds of different things. I was just like, I started writing it into, I thought would probably be a blog or just some emails that I could send to people when they started out. And I don't know, I just kept going and kept getting bigger and bigger. And yeah, also that mentor uh, that I spoke of that told me to go and do that job, uh, his name's Glenn, uh, in, when we were chatting one day, I was like, I wish somebody told me at age 25 to just write some books because he's now, I think he's got three books that he's released. Oh, really? Wow. I was like, oh, that's a good challenge from him. I think I was, I was probably 25, 26 at the time. So I was like, all right, I'll start a book. This is not easy to write a book. No, especially yeah. when you're juggling it with full-time work, but they kind of complemented each other because I'd have the experience on set and then I could come home and write two pages about it that night because it was fresh in my mind and I knew exactly what to think about it. And right. Um, so like a lot of material. Yeah. Going to work will give me the material. Like at the back, there's a glossary with, I don't know, a couple of hundred different terms that we use and somebody would say yeah. something. I'd be like, Oh, and I write it in my phone oh, to yeah. remind me to go home and write that term in the glossary at the end of the day. So people can look it up and go, what the heck does this oh, mean? This is like essential for, for filmmakers because yeah. the terminology, you got to know. Yeah, exactly. Because if somebody, <laughs> this is funny, somebody once, we were doing like a really small budget thing and somebody told uh, like a, a PA, it was his first job ever, told him to go fill the meter and he's like, fill the meter. What the hell does fill the meter mean? And then he just walked away and like, without asking a didn't question, he didn't know what to do. Yeah. But the, the, the guy was just saying, fill the meter, fill like the, the parking meter yeah. outside. <laughs> it wasn't like some code for but like, you feel like an idiot charge. asking. So you, have you just to. be like, yeah, copy that and walk off and hope that it doesn't get noticed. Yeah. Um, Dirty. But that's, there's that's, still, that's, there's still so many things that pop up like that. That doesn't have every single film term in there. Well, I like that you have call sheet colleague. That's definitely an Australian well, yeah. version of it, isn't it? Well, I would say that on this pilot that I did in New York, I would say I'm taking the callies to set and the second AD would look at me and be like, what did you just say? I'm like, yeah. the callies, I'm taking them to set. They're printed. They're ready to go. She'd be like, it's a call sheet. I'm like, yeah, the callie. The callie. <laughs> I like callie better, man. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. there's, there's probably some Australian turns in there that people are like, that no that doesn't fly in the u.s but there's a bit of overlap and and various things so who did the the illustrations uh, and which one are you on that <laughs> Do you, if you were to pick yeah you. there's an ad there. Oh, there is. where is he no I, that's I, the director you got uh yeah the director the producer with his briefcase of money <laughs> that's amazing the boom guy I like with his gut out oh i didn't um, this is all like who who drew this uh, so there's an illustrator called Alan Rath. Mm -hmm. um, he's a friend of mine who now lives in New Zealand. He is a New Zealander. Mm -hmm. um, and he does these amazing illustrations like that. And I just loved his work and asked him to do one for me and then sent him photos and, and um, descriptions of all these different characters. And mm -hmm. uh, he sketched some stuff up and then we worked on it and made some adjustments and stuff. You've yeah. probably uh, imagined gotten a lot of people reaching out to you uh, about the book like I guess what's the most commonly asked questions that people may ask you or, or about the book? Yeah. Or just about your career in film. Um, just what to do on set because it's so hard to get that real world experience. It's mm -hmm. so hard to get that in because it's such a competitive industry to begin with. So you might get plucked out of one out of a hundred to go and be the work experience person on a certain shoot or a film or whatever um but to get that that real world advice where it's it's just simple it's like do this and people will like you don't do this because you won't get the next job like that's what yeah. it is like it's just tips to get to work early mm -hmm. make your boss a coffee like real simple stuff but unless somebody tells you directly that's what you got to do then it might take six months or a year to be good at your job and by that time your opportunity might have passed like yeah it, it's such a brutal industry sometimes if somebody's not good in my team in the first couple of days like it just takes too much time to train them into what you want them to be but hopefully somebody can read this and and show up on, on day one and be 
a little bit better than what they were going to be and, and give them a chance to actually make it through and, and continue to work. So. Yeah. I, I, first impression is so important. Yeah. And yeah, if it's your exactly. first shoot ever, yeah. if it's your first big production, like yeah. you, you really want to bring it. You want to put your best foot forward. Yeah. Um, and some people will naturally have that. They might be older in life. They might have worked a bunch of jobs. They might have been an assistant to somebody. So they know exactly what to expect. But somebody might have come straight out of school. They might never have worked a job in their life. They might mm-hmm. have been a sports star that trained as a sports star all their life and now they've finished college, didn't quite make it and are starting out in the film industry. And it's like, go and work really hard on a film set. And they're like, I don't know what to do. So they, that yeah. first day they appear really shy, but in the eyes of everybody else, they're just useless because they're not confident in what they do. So. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> I had that. Like I, I've talked about this before, but like, I did. Uh, I've only done one big shoot. Where it was like 30, 40 people. It was a GE commercial spot. It was actually like an online spot, but it was like a nice, nice, decent sized crew there for two days. And I was the DP. And like, I want to see like Wikipedia and Googled what is the DP? Key light. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's like, because now I have to, it is, it's, it's easier to work on small crews in, in term and it's easier to direct when you don't have to direct anybody when you're only directing your own mind yeah and sometimes that's why it's easy if i'm editing my own project i directed um it takes another set of skills to be able to communicate your vision to somebody else it's a little bit easier to say brain yeah. to edit okay this is what i'm um, and i can kind of change things up on the fly and figure it out but then to, to go to the set i have to actually be able to i didn't know any of this lingo i didn't know any of these these words to communicate yeah my vision i didn't even have a vision really my big thing was and like as as a dp i think people give you a little bit of credit and uh, oh, a lot of credit and they they're not like doubting you but so i i was just pretty quiet on set and yeah. i would ask the gaffer like i'd be like hey so uh what do you think uh, about this setup? I would say that for everything. I would ask him, hey, what do you think we should do here? And like, it was clear that he, like, I don't know if it was clear, but it was, for me at least, it was obvious. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. I had never lit a scene like that, but like, luckily enough, they were incredible. And like, this guy had done a lot of DP work as well. So they just kind of set everything up. But I, I swear to God, all I did was I pushed record. <laughs> like, I, that's all I did as the DP. Like, we would just set up these scenes. I would push the dial in, I would hit record, push the dial in, cut. And I pushed record again and that was it. Um, but it's it's incredibly overwhelming, I think, yeah. your first shoot like that. And that uh, can be intimidating for, for, say, myself. Sometimes I'll produce a commercial uh, with a production company called Mint Films that I used to work with a lot in Sydney. Uh, free plug to them. Yeah. Um, and if I'm the producer, like I'm in my mid-20s and I would have people working for us that were in their 40s and 50s. They would have mm. 20 years more experience than me, but they'd be like, what are we doing next, Matt? Or we've got this issue. How are you going to sort it out? Or even just where's lunch or what's the catering, that kind of stuff. I was responsible to these people that were almost twice my age and had way more experience. But the position that you've taken on in that shoot is to to do that job and they're looking to you. So yeah, it can be tough sometimes and, and extremely intimidating. And yeah. I don't know. You just fake it till you make it, I guess. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. You have to just keep pretending the beginning. <laughs> just keep getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. As long as you're going to check, you're all right. But, um, but to me too, it was, it was, um, I, 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 especially early on, I cared less and less about the, the money. I, I and as long as I could like deliver and yeah. like, I'd, be, I'd rather not get paid. I mean, as long as I have some money, <laughs> as long as I could pay rent, but I'd rather, uh, this client be happy and if they're not happy I'd rather give them their money back yeah um, you want to do some rapid fire questions sure let's see if I have them here. I'm not very quick yeah well actually you know what I gotta do that actually I got a question for you this is a new thing I haven't <coughs> done this before but question do you know the rock no Dwayne you know the rock Dwayne the rock Johnson no well, I know who he is, but yeah. I've never met him. You don't know him personally. I didn't. Do, they shot San Andreas in Australia, but oh, I didn't work on it. Damn. I have friends that did. I know his assistant in that was on that film. Facundo was his name. But Facundo. Yeah. All right. But well, this Good is guy. a start. This is a start because that, that's that's six my big, degrees of separation to the Rock. Yeah, yes, yeah, I can do that. That's my big goal right now. Is uh, I want to interview the Rock. I want to get. I want the Rock to sit in that chair <laughs> across from me. Sure. So that's my big goal. All right. Um, I'll talk to Facundo. Talk to Facundo. Let's see if. Um, so he After was after Baywatch. He's probably not doing much at the moment. So <laughs> yeah, he's he's just might be a good time. He, little, little little downtime in between. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to to 
reach out to as many people as I can. How? What do you think I should do in order to get The Rock? Because this is a podcast that a couple hundred people listen to. It's not very big. Um, well, maybe you need to put together a video like that guy did for Emma Watson. I don't, I don't no, Emma, Emma Stone or Emma Watson. I always get them confused. The girl out of La La Land. Emma Stone. Um, and he asked her to be the prom date. Did you see that? No, he did. recreated the opening to La La Land and then it was like, will you be my prom date? Did it work? And she responded. Did it work though? Did she? Well, she responded, but she said, sorry. I'm busy. <laughs> so, but he got a rejection. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I, but I don't want to get rejected by the news. rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's still pretty amazing. Yeah, but maybe he won't be busy. Yeah, maybe somebody else filled in for her. Yeah. Why uh, the rock? It's hard to put in words. He's an interesting... What the rock has done. Yeah, he's pretty... He's a very interesting actor because he'll do all these strange kind of what looks to be a sellout film, but he's actually right into the craft as well. So yeah, he's interesting mix. He, he definitely um, is, is I, I like all sides of him. He also seems like a guy who's completely humble. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the highest paid actors. You might need a bigger chair. <laughs> That's actually, you know what? Maybe I'll take the hinges off the side <laughs> of the chair. You'll need a bigger room. Yeah. I'll get, I'll bring the couch in here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he's a guy that's like, uh, he's, he's very inspiring in terms of like his fitness and like, yeah. you ever see his, his, uh, his meal plan, what he yeah. eats in a given day. I, I saw like some reporter tried to eat what he ate yeah. in a day and like was throwing up by noon. Um, I think like that, that alone, like, and, and the fact that like, he doesn't have to do that right now. He's quote unquote made it. He's gotten to a point where he has yeah. success in his career. He could certainly like chill but he like he he really this is where he finds this is what he's passionate about and he really enjoys it and he's kind of he does a little bit of everything he's got a production company he does all this stuff so um he's somebody who who has i think built something from the ground up literally starting from nothing to to kind of and and still building new things along the way and continuing to do it i think is pretty inspiring um yeah like who would have thought like the wwe wrestling (laughs) star wwf at the time would get to the point now where yeah. he's the highest paid actor in the world like that's insane uh so i want right. to interview him about his story um but this is the first time i brought it up on the podcast <laughs> it's gonna be a thing that i want well, my- I'm, I'm pretty sure he watches yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing it's not about your size of your audience <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it is. it's the size of the rock. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. This is going to be an, an ongoing journey. I'm going to try to ask everybody that comes on the show uh, how they might be able to put me in touch with the rock. <laughs> the rock. <laughs> yeah. no, I'll do my best. Who is the I guy? will send an email for you. Will you? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Hey, no promises, but. <laughs> no promises, but hey, my friend wants to put uh, you put the rock on his pocket. If I could actually interview the rock's assistant, that would be like a step You'll in the right direction. You'll have to travel to the Gold Coast. But okay, hey, maybe, maybe next time I'm in Australia. Here sometime. Yeah, that's, it, it's worth reaching out. So there's this funny video on <laughs> YouTube uh, of Facundo sculling milk and saying he's going to turn into the rock and, and be massive and then throws down the milk and cut to it's the rock finishing sculling the milk. Oh my so God. That's pretty cool. That's good. That's on his YouTube, the, the rock's YouTube channel? Uh, I just know it's on YouTube. Okay. I'm going to have to find that. Maybe I'll put it. Rock sculling milk. Rock sculling milk. Yeah. <laughs> Try that. <laughs> Might be some weird shit that comes up. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if, uh, truth be told, I didn't write any questions. <laughs> this Just is the, Googling the first good interview yeah, questions. Yeah, the first time the first time that I ever did a rapid fire question, I like I, it was an idea that I had before like like probably weeks before I had done the podcast and then it was leading to the end of it and I was like, "You ready for rapid fire?" He's like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Fuck, I didn't write any rapid fire questions." So then I started to write them as I was asking them. Um that's what I'm going to have to do now. What drives you? What drives you to to keep going and and, and this might sound bad, but a sense to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's just uh, part of me is I, I always want to achieve stuff, whether it be climb a mountain, ride a good wave. Uh, I don't know. Even finish the house chores before I sit down and watch a movie or something like mm-hmm. that. I don't know. That's just who I am. And it sounds really lame and boring, but I just want to achieve. I just like achieving things and winning. <laughs> winning. <laughs> winning. I like winning too. Do you, uh, Is it... The act of winning, or is it the the kind of like? Do, do you still get oh, yeah. excited? I love about the, to rub it. In. The, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> no, like uh, it's not about getting the paycheck at the end of the the thing, or no. or like finishing the film. It's kind of about doing something. It's about the think. adventure. I love yeah. the adventure as well, uh, but my mind is a, a just full of lists, and so to be honest, part of it is just ticking off 
each box. Do you have being like I've done that? I've done that. Do you I've have like an actual list or do you have like a mental list? I have lots of lists. <laughs> Bit of both. My notes in my phone is full of lists, whether it's books to read, film ideas, things to do, people to email, all kinds of different random things. Oh, that's that's great. just how I work. My, a- I think my mind, uh, I'm not very good at remembering stuff. Um, so I just write it down. As long as it's written down, I can always deal with it. So, What advice would you give to somebody, an, a non-filmmaker setting out in a, in a creative pursuit? What one thing should they, what one thing can they do today that's going to help them? Uh, it sounds like a simple answer again, but work hard. The people I've seen succeed, mainly in the film industry because that's what I work in, but I think also in any term, setting up a business, doing well, whether it be in real estate, finance, as a school teacher, what, whatever you do, it comes down to working hard. It, it, as long as you stick at working hard for long enough, eventually things will happen for you and, and you'll crack whatever you're trying to crack. So if you're starting a business, working extremely hard at that business, but also working smart, not just putting in hours and hours of wasted time, but getting advice from the right people, getting help from say you need a graphic designer to do your logo, like paying the right people to, to make you better than the next person or make your business stand out better than the next business. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to working hard. Like you talked about The Rock, like look at his schedule. He trains so hard every day. He sticks to such a regiment, uh, regimented day, but look at the results. Like he's in all these Hollywood films, so he's doing really well. Yeah, there, there's uh, a reason why it, like he does yeah, that stuff. It's because exactly. it works. It's and, and unfortunately, some people just get lucky and you're like, they did nothing and they just got <laughs> cast in a film or their dad is the CEO of some company and they got a good in or something like that. But hard work sustains you. Like That'll yeah. keep you going through your career. If if somebody's dad gets them a job first out, first time out of school, they might get lucky for that first one or two films, but people find out pretty quick whether they're actually going to be an asset to the to the work or not. So before somebody goes to bed tonight, uh, what would you tell them to read, watch, or listen to? Uh, and it might be starting. Oh, there we go. That's an easy one. Set Life. There's one. That's uh, what they can read. To, to read. Uh, Set Life. It's available. What's the website? Setlifebook.com. Setlifebook.com. I mean, or honestly. Amazon. It's, d- it, for everybody, it's Amazon. Yeah. Really. I do have a, a, quite a bit of uh, the core audience is, uh, is filmmakers and creative. So I think this would actually be incredibly helpful for them. <laughs> let's, let's wipe that one. Yeah. But on a serious note, uh, I read a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and mine's generally aimed at producing. Um, so I'll read a lot of producers' books like... Uh, uh, Ted Hope has released a book called Hope for Film, which is great. Uh, One called So You Think You're a Producer by Lawrence Terman, I think it is. Um, So I focus on stuff like that, but I read anybody that's inspirational to me. So Walt Disney has a bunch of uh, biographies out, which I found incredible. He was an incredible person. Mm. Um, I found Steve Jobs' book inspiring um, just of what he uh, about what he created. He might have been an interesting character, but you can't argue with what he's actually created. Yeah, that was a really, um, really, I think, well-rounded book too. Yeah, showing both sides of him. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, but I also read novels and stories and all kinds of stuff just to get that creative kind of producing side of me going and thinking of stories, or I might want to try and option a book or that kind of stuff. So. Mm. That didn't give you one specific answer. No, but I think that's anything. enough. I think the Any. answer should be anything. That's as long as true. you're reading and learning from people, you'll always be moving forward. So yeah. I'll, I'll go through stints of six months. I'm like, I haven't read anything for six months and I'll feel dry creatively because I'm not getting that input of just people telling stories mm-hmm. or I feel uninspired because I haven't read about somebody else's struggle when they were first starting out as a producer or a filmmaker or whatever. Um, so anything, I think just pick up books and read them and get advice from people that have done it before. Yeah, you. I tend, I'd go through the same thing where there will be maybe six months where I don't read a book and then I'll read like 15, 20 books in a row. And it's, it, I feel guilty when I'm not doing it. And a part of, and that's just who I am, always guilty about everything. But I feel like there is a, there, there's an aspect to, um, you do go on laws and that's fine. Be okay with it. But then I think there's a lot of inspiration that you can gather from, from books, podcasts, yeah. learning from other people yeah. and, and hearing from other people's yeah, stories. Yeah, exactly. Um, so good. That's, watch. that's, yeah, watch. 
Well, at the moment, I'm watching. Oh, I watch so many things. This is bad to admit it, but I never got through Breaking Bad. So I'm in the mm. fourth season at the moment, watching that. Yeah, because so to get many pretty... people bring it up, and I'm like, I haven't seen it. Yeah, and yeah. And they're like, What? Yeah, <laughs> you disgusting. have to watch. There's certain series that you have to have watched, and Breaking Bad is one. I was like, it's Okay, up, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll get through that now. So yeah, I'm fantastic. almost done. It's fantastic. Um, I don't know. Watch whatever it, whatever you enjoy. There's so much content out there now. It's it's hard. It's ridiculous how many choices you have. Like how many times do you sit on Netflix or Amazon or whatever and just spend the next half an hour trying to decide what you want to watch rather than just you spend more act, time looking for what actually to watch. watching yeah. something. What uh, uh what's so I, I I can never answer like favorite thing favorite movie like i don't i, don't, I can't do that yeah, just because there's just too many yeah. but it's I, I guess favorite of late so has there been um something on netflix maybe besides minimalism uh, of course <laughs> oh minimalism yeah, was my there. favorite yeah yeah, yeah. 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 what a number phenom- one document yeah of 2016 um i'm actually watching amazon at the moment the man in the high castle and it's such an interesting yeah. concept of if Japan and uh, the Nazis won World War Two. Beautifully so, shot. Like that as just a one line synopsis. Immediately, everybody's like, "That's a great idea." Cool. Yeah. How you do that is a whole nother story. Um, and the series is incredible of what they've created. I've I've found the second uh, season a little bit drags on and just becomes about the drama. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas I, I like the situation rather than the drama. I don't care about the love stories where my wife gets sold on all the relationships that's going on. I just want to see interesting situations people get put in. And um, and then listen. Do you listen, listen to podcasts? I've just started again. I went through a big phase probably three, four years ago where I'd listen to podcasts on my way to work because I did a lot of driving for work. Um, and then stopped. I hadn't really listened to them for probably two, three years. And literally about a week ago, I just subscribed to a whole, a whole new bunch. I was telling you earlier about yeah. this American life, how I just listen to those random stories and it inspires me to, to think about other stories or they'll, they'll say one sentence about a character and it'll prompt me to go and write a short synopsis about what if this character did this or um, that kind of stuff. Oh, that's so, great. Any final, final words? Just keep going. So many people get discouraged along the way because I don't know, our generation particularly is probably like, you can do anything. You'll be doing anything. You'll be a millionaire by 25. You'll be the boss of everybody. But it's not the truth. It actually takes a lot of time. And you can look at filmmakers like working with Ridley Scott. He directed his first film when he was early 40s. Like how many directors are actually going to wait until their early 40s to direct their first film and think like just continue on that um so for me i think just for young people getting into it like just just keep going and have some patience right have some patience and and also enjoy what you're doing like looking back on the films that i've worked with or the people that i've worked with is so cool and Mm -hmm. and even just to the relationships that i've built with with friends that i've spent 60 hours a week with for six months straight and, and things like that and how you get to know their family or their kids and, and that kind of stuff and support them on their journey whether they're a, I have friends that are also assistant directors that want to be directors or whether they're a young c- camera person looking to be a dp and that kind of stuff just supporting their journey as well so. that's great man um so thanks for coming on the show and that's Anytime. a wrap that's it that's cool. what I say. I say that's a wrap. Okay, right. Okay, Go ahead. That's a wrap. <laughs> nice. That's good. Thanks for tuning in to the Ground Up Show. I'm giving away access to two hours worth of extended interviews to anyone who reviews the Ground Up Show on iTunes. These interviews with the producers of Minimalism give a never-before-seen look at how he created the film from nothing. Simply send a screenshot of your review to hello at mattdiavella.com, and I'll send you the private links to watch the interviews. Thanks for watching.